it's episode 374 of This Is Whole Life. I am he. I am he, you say. Yes, I am he. This is week five of the Chosen series. I say this every week, but I feel like I have to because someone came up to me in the lobby this week and was like, hey, 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 spoiler alerts. And I'm like, hey, 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 you have to watch before you listen. I, I, I do say it, though, every week, spoiler alerts ahead, because sometimes we open our mouths about other episodes that kind of work together. Not the same one, but they kind of have themes that run throughout. So you never know where we might go. Could be food. It could be another season, another episode of The Chosen. I wonder, if I, I wonder if I should start putting spoiler alerts when I tell Bible stories. <laughs> just in case you haven't gotten to this part of the Bible yet. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Just letting you know <laughs> there will be a spoiler. Yep. No, that's kind of Joseph a... did find his brothers. That's yes. He did. Yes, there we go. It's kind of like putting just kind of baiting the hook a little bit, you know. If you, oh, wait, there's more to this story somewhere. And we will get to that this week too, because I don't know, maybe I was the only one that didn't know we were going to be headed to Genesis during this message. It seemed like a, a something that I'd never considered before, so stay tuned for that. But the thing that struck me right off the bat was, you know, Samaritans versus the Jews. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no love loss here. <laughs> and this just seems so much, you know, and you said it was a disagreement over which parts of the Bible were still relevant. Even then... Like, which parts of the Bible were relevant, and who was the real remnant of God? And I'm like, wow, 2,000 years hasn't changed a whole heck of a lot, has it? Nope. Because nope. we have how many thousands of denominations that all have a different picture, maybe not of everything, but of yeah. some of some of these same issues. And Yeah, the major fighting points for the between the two are that the Samaritans believed that you could only worship God on Mount Gerizim, and the Jews believed that it was on at the temple, at the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah. And then the, the Samaritans also believed that only the first five books of the Old Testament, so what it's known as the Pentateuch, that only those that was it? were valid, nothing else. And they believed, the Samaritans believed they had a straight uh, genealogy from Jacob, which made them better. Israelites, if you will, than, than the Jewish people. The Jewish uh, folks had been exiled to Babylon and come back. A lot of the Samaritans had actually stayed in the area, if you will. And um, and so there was that, that kind of rivalry going on that uh, I've, I've got the Bible figured out better than you do kind of thing between the two of them. And oftentimes, I think, I've all, I think that I've been tempted when I read the, between the... Um, uh, the story between, in fact, I think I've said in sermons in the past that, you know, if you want to kind of understand the difference between the Samaritans and the Jews, you need to kind of think about the difference between Christianity and Islam, but that's actually way too big a difference. Mm. Um, the difference is actually much more subtle than that. The, the, the difference, like I said in the sermon, uh, from the research, and, and who knows what I'll be saying in five years from now, the more research I do. <laughs> but um, the research that I did was it was a much more like the difference between Protestants and Catholics or the difference between uh, Sunni and Shiite Muslims. Mm. And in fact, in the book that I referenced, the Jewish Gospel of John, that was uh, uh, written by Eli Lazorkin Eisenberg, Eisenberg basically says that he uses the Sunni uh, Shiite as mm. as the difference between the two, um, between the, the Jewish folks and the um, Samaritans. Aren't you glad your parents named you Ken? That's a long name. Almost I don't, every I don't day. How, I don't know how you got through that last name. I would have actually absolutely <laughs> slaughtered him. Probably a super smart guy by the sounds of it, but what a name to have to remember. It's a fascinating book, by the way. If you're looking for an interesting book, it's a it's a... If you're not familiar with this, there a lot of people find the book of John to be anti-Semitic. If you get into theology circles, that's kind of one of the the, the hmm. critiques of the book of John is that it's it's anti-Jew. And the and the reason is that that John loves to use the phrase at that time the Jews did this or mm. the Jews did that. And Eisenberg is Jewish and he is a Christian and he is defensive of John, in the sense that he feels like um, he, John's being misunderstood, that John isn't trying to disparage Jewish people, uh, but Just rather he's, out but he's more. well, not even that. He actually um, he yeah. thinks that John's actually elevating Jewish people through mm -hmm. what he's doing, yep. and it's an interesting. Yeah, I couldn't like lay it all out for you right now, and you wouldn't want me to. But it's if you're interested in the book, it's it's called the Jewish Gospel of John, and. 
one of the things I enjoy about it is I always enjoy reading something where I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way before. And hmm. he does a lot of that in there. It's, he sees it through. Um, if you've never really read Jewish writers who have written about the Gospels, it's very fascinating to see it through Jewish eyes, particularly scholarly Jewish eyes, because they they come at it. I think probably from the way that Paul came at it and from where a lot of the early disciples would have come because they understand the Old Testament very well and they see the connections in different ways than we do because we tend to be New Testament centric and then go back to the Old Testament for things, whereas they tend to be Old Testament and go, oh, and that's the fulfillment here in the New Testament. Hmm. And so, anyway. All right, well, yeah. I will try to spell that name and uh, find a link to it <laughs> yeah. and put it into the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. In the... <laughs> yeah. What was the title again? And I th- uh, the Jewish Gospel of John I'll by start with Eli that. Lazorkin Eisenberg. And Eisenberg. That's, uh, you can find that on, I, I believe I listened to it on Audible. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I'm, I'm sure you can buy it off of Amazon as well. Yeah, cool. Well, we'll put a link, and then that'll have uh, we'll have links to the Audible if needed. So I was thinking about when you were talking, like that was one thing that I don't know that we talk a lot about the differences of the the Jews and the Samaritans, other than that it's always portrayed as they really, really didn't like each other. But mm-hmm. so I thought it was mm-hmm. interesting that you investigated the why, and then further. Jesus talking to the woman at the well. Again, you would we can kind of assume that well, men didn't really converse with women all that much at the well at the middle of the day or in the being at the well during the middle of the day. But this idea that possibly she took it as Jesus flirting, I just thought that that was I thought that was an interesting, but I you can almost you can almost see that that could be a possibility. Yeah. That they that she would think that he was somehow well, it's very forward. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, if if I uh, went into a restaurant and sat down next to a woman and said, hey, can I buy you a drink? <laughs> and, you know, it, it's like, well, wait a minute. And, and for those of you who are like getting a little upset and I'm like, no, wait a minute. I'm not suggesting Jesus was flirting with her. I'm just telling you that Moses met his wife <laughs> yeah. at a well and asked her, hey, can you give me some water? Same thing with Jacob. And for people who are very, for people who both the Samaritans and Jewish people who are very familiar with the Old Testament, meeting your spouse at a well was not an uncommon thing. Yeah. And so for Jesus to walk up to that well and for him to then to start talking to a Samaritan woman, which he wasn't supposed to, he w- he really wasn't going to be talking to Jew- uh, to Samaritan men. And there, I remember reading. I wish I could cite where I found, I saw it, but I remember reading a while back that there is some Jewish source that suggested that Jewish men should only talk to their own wives sparingly. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, wow. so, 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 for Jesus to be doing that could have been viewed very much as, "What are you? What's what's going on here? Why are you doing this?" I mean, even the engagement with the disciples afterwards, mm-hmm. they're questioning yeah. that same thing. Yeah. And if they were there, they could have, you know, they could have wondered what's, you know, what is yeah. going on here. It's a- I, I just want to say too, Ken, I very, as a woman, I very much appreciated your willingness to be so thoughtful of the status of this woman and why we have always look at her as kind of a, you know, the the worst type of person, the worst type of woman. It's very easy uh, for women to be shamed in scripture and for us to go along with that. And I, so I love the insight that you gave, very thoughtful insight of potentially it might have been a different situation for her. And I just, I wanted to thank you for that. Yeah. And I think what you're, you're referring to is the, uh, what I mentioned in the sermon that, uh, that Mike Tucker uh, from, he used to be the um, executive director of Faith for Today. Uh, he was at, a, at some meetings that I was at, and he was speaking. He was talking about the woman at the well, and he said, I think we get her wrong. And he shared some, some of that. And then, again, back to the Jewish Gospel of John, Eisenberg also very strongly feels like um, this woman has been very misunderstood throughout Christ, you know, Christian history. And it, it, you know we've we've basically the 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 narrative has been 
This is a woman who's been married five times. She's committed adultery on all of her husbands, mm. and now she's living in sin with somebody who isn't her husband. And you know what? Maybe that is right. It could be. It's a possibility. But I think it, it the, the arguments that, that Mike made and that Eli make are actually stronger in my mind than this argument because – uh, the Samaritans had the same penalty for adultery that the Jewish people did. Is that they they could stone somebody to death, and they could they could say, you know, you're you've committed adultery, you're going to be stoned to death, and so they had that same penalty. Remember, they, the first five books of the Old Testament were valid for them. But let's go ahead and say that the culture had evolved to that point where they weren't doing that anymore, where they weren't stoning people who committed adultery. Maybe they weren't, even though, let's not forget that Jesus had a woman brought before right. him. In his day. Yeah. yeah. His, you know. But let's go ahead and say that wasn't the case. Even so, think through the logic of this. This woman cannot, she cannot file for divorce herself. Because women weren't allowed. Once you got married in that in that time, the only person who could release you from the marriage was the husband. And he had to write out a, a, a divorce, a bill of divorce. What are the chances a guy is going that that this woman's able to commit adultery on five husbands, and each one of them is like, oh yeah, I'll marry her. I've been having adult, uh, you know, I've been having an outside. Affair. I'll have <laughs> this happens five times, and now she's living with a guy that she's not married to. To me, for me, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. What makes a lot more sense to me is one of the things that I, I can't remember whether it was Mike or whether it was Eli that suggested it, but that this woman maybe was barren. That seemed, the, that seemed really logical. Because that, that is a very legitimate reason for letting somebody for in that time. I should say in that, that time. In that time. Thank you. Let me clarify where I'm going. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tammy. From a theological understanding of that time and that place, being barren was a very legitimate reason for somebody to be divorced. And it was also a reason why that person might remarry with the idea of that, well, you know, maybe, mm, yeah. maybe she'll be able to give birth or whatever. And it, and so that's a potential, or maybe there was just something about her that men, once they married her, found that they didn't like, and for whatever reason, um, and, and it didn't have to be much in that yeah. time and place, unfortunately. And so for whatever reason, she kept getting divorced. And then when we say the man that she's living with isn't her husband, the the why do we leave out the possibility that, that could be her father or her brother or yeah. an uncle or somebody like that? And, and I think the reason we do is because we've been conditioned to think, oh, it's adultery. She's she's committing adultery. Well, in that time, in that place, um, if you didn't have a husband, you were going to be living with a man that wasn't your husband. And more, chan- more than not, likely it was going to be, if you were fortunate enough, it was going to be a father or a brother or somebody who is going to look out for you and take care of you. But for me, it, the question is that when this woman runs into town and says, hey, I found a guy who's told me everything about myself, who knows everything about me, could this be the Messiah? Why would the people of that village put a lot of stock in what somebody who was known to, if, if she was adulterous, had bad character, why would they be like, oh, yeah, okay, no, everybody mm-hmm. knows who you are, come on. Yeah. yeah, which it makes to me a lot more sense that this that there was a more extended conversation that Jesus had with her, where he saw her, he spoke with her, and she goes back to the village and said, "Look, you guys, the pain and hurt that I've been feeling in my life, this man understands. And look, he told me about myself, and he told me and and being barren yeah. would have been that big of a oh, stigma it would have been anyway. Huge. Yeah, just think about um, just think in in uh, it is the is it no. Is the uh, I'm sorry I'm trying to I'm go, no it's the book of Luke that gives the um, the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth, but the point is think about Zachariah and Elizabeth that they're older uh, Elizabeth can't have a baby she's married um, thinking this this by the way goes to Zachariah's character that he was a good man that mm-hmm. he didn't choose to divorce her take on another wife or something like that <laughs> yeah. in that time in that place, but. It would have been a huge deal for her not to be the Samaritan woman not to be able to have and then mm-hmm. to be and then to be thrown aside by five different men. You no good. You know, and yeah. think yeah. about where that would put her and how she would feel as a human being and the sense of worth that she has. 
And to me, that's such a more compelling story about who Jesus is, Mm -hmm. that Jesus comes along to this woman who has been rejected over and over due to no, really no fault of her own. Yeah. And... um, and I think it's just this beautiful picture of of Jesus coming along and seeing somebody who's not been seen by five men who hasn't and, and he comes and he sees her and he cares about her. And he's not supposed to. And he's not supposed <laughs> yeah. to. And and it's just to me it's just this gorgeous picture. So I think, like I said, I think that good people can have a a lively discussion on the merits of it. I can see it I can see it both ways, but for me the other I like this argument. And I think it's worth consideration for sure. And um, and to me, it adds some dimension and uh, depth to it. Yeah, that you know, you think about the the conversation between uh, Jesus and this woman. Even her comebacks were much more type of comebacks that she would have mustered from the dismissiveness that she would have experienced in her life, because she wasn't. She wasn't ready to just be this wilting person. She came back. I mean, she, she in a sense had, uh, you know, she was ready to argue in a way. She gave him some lip. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right off the bat. Like, she was arg- and she yeah. was angry. Yeah. She was hurt. She yeah. sounds, it wasn't you're for right. Shame. She does sound yeah. like a hurt person, not yeah. a oh, um, and you know. And if she is this, you know, horribly promiscuous person, and she and it, and Jesus is asking her for water. It, you might think maybe she'd start flirting. Yeah. And that's not yeah. what she does. She's like, no. well, exactly. why are you talking to me? And she's exactly. kind of not just that, she talks theology. Yeah. 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 She doesn't uh she doesn't play that role yeah. of uh promiscuousness. Yeah. That's good. Well, you know, I think Ken, you mentioned I think it was last week that, you know, a lot of the these episodes of The Chosen start out with some biblical mm-hmm. his, history that yeah. goes with it. And I think this one is my favorite yeah. because the guy from Canaan who is talking to uh, to Jacob <laughs> and is just like, oh, yeah. uh, what does he call him? Foreigner or um, sojourner sojourner or something like that. Oh, silly foreigner. He's yeah. like, the water, yeah. you know, you're not going to find water here. It runs around. Not through the mountain, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and he's just totally like, so you know, there was that one time I saw my God where he wrestled and broke my hip, and he's like, oh, you silly, <laughs> yeah. silly man. He's like, not only do you pick a God who's invisible, who's you know, yeah. Yeah. promises take generations, and then it's so powerful in that scene though when they call the his sons call for him and they go over, yeah, and he said we didn't choose him, and he puts his hand down in the water on the top of this top of this mountain or this giant hill, and. He's like he chose us, yeah. And what a what a cool way for that story. But then you take this to the bones of Joseph that were brought back from Egypt, mm-hmm. and I guess I I knew that the bones were taken, yeah. uh, were back, but that this was the place that they were that the the plot was purchased, and then that Jacob comes along a couple generations later, and is brought here and is and is digging the well, and. That we go back to Genesis. <laughs> yeah, so so Jacob and his sons dig the well. And then and then then later on Joseph gets sold into slavery. And oh, then right. and, to, then, and then Joseph dies in Egypt and is buried in Egypt. And but before he dies, he tells his family, he says, I, I when you are not always going to be here in Egypt. And when you go back to the promised land that God's promised us, I want you to take my bones and I want you to bury them basically in the field that my dad gave to me, which is the field, field that where didn't... this well is at. Yeah. And so Joseph is buried right where Jesus is having this conversation with with the um, Samaritan woman. Yeah. But the idea that she could be a daughter of Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of crazy. Isn't it? I mean, when and these are the things that when you read your Bible and you're you're studying, you're 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 paying attention. You're trying to find those those things where I've never looked, I've never seen it this way, or I've never thought of it that way. And to to drop both of these in the same message, I was like, wow, Ken was working overtime this week. <laughs> he was gone to Guatemala, and he comes with two of these that really make your understanding of Jesus, even you know, choose which side you believe if, if, or, or maybe it's even a different side we haven't thought about with, with the woman at the well, who she was, but you've got a different way to think about it, to look at it, to consider it. 
And then when you, when you, them talking about these promises that take generations and you think that is one of the coolest circles you could ever possibly yeah. imagine two people that basically were so alienated yeah. in, in different ways, even different times. Yeah. One a man, one a woman, but it, I mean, if that could be, how how cool and how Isn't awesome just, is God? And I don't think that I, I really genuinely don't think that's any accident because, like I said in in John four, where this story is recorded, it talks about it says um, the the where the well that Jacob dug and the field that he gave his son Joseph. He specifically, specifically. John. John specifically cites that he it's not he doesn't say say it Jacob's well he actually includes Joseph's name in there and and if you think John has as much to say as any gospel writer except for maybe Luke that said there's there's not that much in in the gospel of John when you start you think it he's very careful about what he says and how he says it and the way he references things and so I really think that he didn't just throw that away. It wasn't that he just like, oh, by the way, you know, you know, the red barn over here. It was very purposeful that he said that the field that his his father uh, or that that Jacob gave his son Joseph. And again, going to the, I think that John was trying to take his Jewish readers and remind them that there's going to be a parallel between uh, Joseph and the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman was a a cast out, a, a somebody that had been rejected by the family. Mm. Joseph was somebody who was cast out, rejected by the family, and here Joseph has been promised in in, in the the sermon I talked about this text where Jacob prays a blessing on Joseph before Jacob dies. It's his kind of his closing blessing that he does for all of his boys, but he has a special blessing for for Joseph. And the coolest, this is the part that I had, I had not really found until I was really researching this study. That some of the other stuff I'd found in, in some of the other places, but as I was kind of digging deeper, that blessing is so cool because it says, you know, Joseph will be a branch that um, that rises up from this well or spring or, or something and then over, goes over the wall. And the word for branch um, is, it, it's, it's B-A-R, which is usually how you... Um, if you're addressing a son, and so you think about mm. bar mitzvah um, oh, okay. or something like that, so that's um, and so that's the word that's right there. And so uh, my my Hebrew is not good enough for me to explain why they translate it branch, but they do because when I looked into uh, the dictionary, that that's one of the options. It can be branch or son. But what's fascinating to me is that the, the the branch hanging over the wall is bat, which is if you've mm. ever heard of a bat mitzvah, which is Le- for a, a woman. A, a woman. Hmm. And so, so you have two mention of sons, but then you also have a mention of a daughter. This branch that's hanging over the wall, and in, I don't know. It's just my holy imagination and, and putting things together. But it feels to me a lot like John is pointing to Jesus and going, "Look." You know that promise that all those years ago, that that blessing that Jacob prayed on Joseph, Joseph's bones are in that field when Jesus keeps the promise to to Joseph's way down there granddaughter, you know, descendant, um, that he keeps the promise by coming to her and revealing himself as the Messiah and revealing where that water is. Yeah. was going to come from, because it says, uh, may you be blessed from the basically the skies above and the, the, the waters of the deep. And so Jesus comes and fulfills that promise there. He says, I'm going to give you fresh living water. I'm going to do that for you. And, and I am he, I am the Messiah. Um, and to me, that is just the coolest. I don't know whether the chosen had thought about all that stuff and was or whether they were just kind of going off of Jacob's well being there Jacob and 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 so the fulfillment is with Jacob but the but the cool thing to me is that God does keep his promises and like the chosen points out sometimes it's generations, generations. Mm-hmm. but God doesn't forget yeah and God does care and um and God does do right by the people who love him and uh and are called according to his plan is as Paul says. Well, I thought this was maybe as cool a moment as there is, maybe like when in the first episode with Mary, when Jesus 
you know, calls her by name and she stops in her tracks and then he, he hug, you know, gives her a hug. And I mean, that just, you know, better bring tears to your eyes. It raises the, the hair on your, <laughs> on your arms. Yeah. And, and when he tells her that and like her immediately, you see the change in her and you can just imagine. Yeah. And, and then with this extra piece in there, how cool that, how cool of a portrayal of God that. To, to stop and think about he cares about this person that nobody else I mean at least Joseph you know his he, he had family that cared for her for him and in this point it seems like she has absolutely mm-hmm. nobody well yeah but right. keep in mind Joseph didn't have anybody for the first well, number of years I mean it's only after Pharaoh elevates him and I want I want to th- say Joseph how long was Joseph was it 12 years before that he was in Egypt before he was it was probably close to that. I think yeah. It was quite yeah. a while. So yeah. fifteen. Or yeah, because he was wasn't he like twenty two or twenty three when he was? Or I thought I think I've read that when he became. Um, I can't. Rem- I can't remember what that. it is, but he was. My, my point is that you have to remember that Joseph was all by himself. He was literally sold by his family, which I mean, you just think about the lowest of the low th- type of things, sold by his family. He manages to pull himself up by the bootstraps with Potiphar only to be slapped down for something that he didn't do, thrown into prison, pulls himself up by the bootstraps there. And then when he goes and does a favor, the guy forgets all about him for, for two years. Yeah. Um, and and so here's Joseph having to learn patience and learn God's timing. And the Samaritan woman obviously has a similar experience, experience that she's yeah. going through that 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 yeah. she goes through five husbands and and a lot of anguish before that the promises come to her and and I think that's by the way that isn't that just a for whatever marriage you're on right now God hasn't forgotten about you and God will keep his promises to you too and God hasn't I mean I think that's one of the things that that we just sometimes we really give people a hard time when when things don't go the way that we all surmise that they should be going, and yet God doesn't give up on us. He doesn't forget about us. He's there to fulfill his promises, and he shows up. And, yeah. and I think that's something we always really need to to hold on to, and, and that we ought to also show the same kind of grace and compassion as well um, to those around us. Amen. Well, you may have just answered my... The last thing I was thinking of is, what can we take away from this when you know we talk about Jesus and the Samaritan woman and all the those little intricate detail details we just talked about, but but you know maybe mending bridges or speaking restoratively to people from you know other denominations or people that as a church they've been hurt because we all know somebody or maybe we've been that person in the past. And, you know, here's two people that, you know, should not get along together. Um, you know, it's, it's a it's a crazy thing that they're even talking to each other. I mean, I would hope that there's nobody in, in today's world, at least, you know, in the realms of Christianity that we couldn't speak to or would be thought of as odd if we were to embrace them in conversation for some reason. But is there is there any is there any lesson that we can pull from that as we, you know, just try to spread the good, the news of the gospel in, do, is there ways that we're doing it wrong that could cause someone to, you know, have that kind of headbutting against us or to elicit that kind of reaction? Or is it just, just Jesus all, all the time and, and um, let the, let the details work themselves out as we go. I just thought it was a good, yeah. they made it work and there's, maybe there's something in there for us. I love um, the way that Jesus interacts with the Samaritan woman. He's he asks questions, he listens, he doesn't get combative when when things, and at the same time, he's also a truth teller. You know, mm-hmm. it's I think that one of the interesting things is that Jesus says, you know, you Samaritans worship what you don't really understand, and by the way, salvation does come from the Jews. So you could make an argument that wasn't particularly, I mean, that was, that was kind of like, hey, we're right about some things here. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, Jesus is so loving to her and so um, inclusive because after he says that, and it's the part that's important, is he said that there will come a time when we are all mm-hmm. not worship in any place. So basically he says, you know, the, the whole debate over where we worship, that's about to become moot. 
because there's going to be a time where we're all going to worship together in in spirit and in truth, and that's where the true believer will go. Mm-hmm. And so, I just love the way that Jesus interacts uh, with her, and I, I think it's worth seeing down and, and looking through and, and thinking about yourself when it comes to it. But I think the lesson I was hoping people would take away from this week is that that you and I can be um, we can be Jesus' hand and feet to take blessings to people. Um, that like Jesus, we can show up at the well, we can show up at the grocery store, we can show up and let somebody know that something that God has promised to them is right there waiting for them, that God hasn't forgotten about them, and that God has that good thing there to give to them. And I think that's um, that's what I'd love for us to take away from it. Yeah, I love I love the, the threads that you uh, connected uh, in this, Ken, and I think it's very intuitive you know, between the bones and the, the place and everything. And I, I do think the, one of the main things that came to me through your sermon was what I believe is a real priority of Jesus, of the interconnectedness of humanity. Mm-hmm. And I, I do think sometimes we miss that when we try to stay in our own corners mm-hmm. or even if I'm viewing other people as the Samaritan wo- woman where I may be the Samaritan woman, you know, and I think if we just view humanity and different people in that same light and understand that the connectedness is really a priority. I I do think the bottom, the base of all of those, you know, it always comes down to, you know, resources, money, it comes down to those kind of things. Here's the disciples going into town to get food. Uh, Jesus doesn't go into town with them. He stays out for a reason. This woman comes all the way out from town to get water because it's you can't get it in town. So there's this constant idea that I've got to go get something. And that's what I love the statement that you said, hey, what I can give, you will never thirst again. And she goes, yeah, give me some of that. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. I'd, I'd like to save me a couple <laughs> trips out here. And, and I think that it's always been an issue of scarcity. And I think mm. if we can get around the fact that Jesus is abundant and that Jesus, that this is constant, this is flowing all the time. If if we had, I think it would break down some of those barriers that you keep you keep because it's always about what you know. What am I going to miss out on if I allow these yeah. other people in? Mm. And so I think us having a, a a broader understanding of the abundance that Jesus brings to the equation, so to speak, I think that gives us a little better motivation at least to let down our guard and to allow others to be a part of this. Yeah. Cause who cares at the end of the day, um, yeah. you know, Jesus has so much for, for all of us that, mm-hmm. that we have nothing to lose, but the scarcity, yeah. like you said, yeah. though, that scarcity is such a big deal mm-hmm. to us on a, on a real basic level that it's hard to almost like if you knew where the switch was, right, I could just flip it off and go, well, I don't need to turn that one on again for a while yeah. until I really feel, you know, whatever. But it doesn't seem to be that you can just turn that off. It's always in our mindset to some degree. And I thought that was another really solid part of the message was just reminding us after being in Guatemala, like, yeah, you know what? Water comes off rooftops there. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, It comes when the rainy season comes. Yeah. And if not, you're going just like the woman at the well to go get the water. And the scarcity that we have is even ridiculous compared to this, the, this really the scarcity complex that other people might have the, in other yeah, places. Yeah. So uh, probably resources. a good thing to remember. Yeah, I thought that one of the things that I thought about was I thought about how fortunate I am here in the United States, all the resources that are available to me that aren't available to the, the friends that I made down in Guatemala. And then I thought, and I bet you that pales in comparison to the resources that God has. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it, compared to what I have, and I, don't, I know, and and I think that, and and here I am questioning whether or not a God who loves me can take care of me. Of course, God can take care of me, and but one of the things that we learned in Guatemala, um, and and I've it's been a, a lesson that that we've kind of learned over the years is that you have to be careful how you help people because you don't always help them by giving them everything, you know, by you know. The temptation is, well, let me just go ahead and take care of you. Here's here's money. Just hmm. you know, I'll pay for all your food. Are you helping them? Well, not really, because you're not 
helping them become self-sustaining and help and helping them think that. And I think that sometimes we misunderstand why God doesn't give us everything at one time. And the reason isn't because God doesn't love us or want to do it. There's there's a couple of times where I was down there that I I w- was I was ready to go. I was ready to go ahead and like let's let's write a check for this. Let's get this taken care of and and you know just good conversations with the great folks at World Vision are like, hey, we we get it. We see it. We we understand it. But that's not what's going to be best. It's not going to help. It's not the, always even respectful. It, yeah, honestly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that we need to understand that with God, that sometimes, you know, sometimes the reason we don't get things is not because God doesn't care, but because God does care. Yeah. And it's what's in our best interest in the long term versus a short term approach to things. So I'll tell you what, though, Guatemala was amazing. What a great, what a great trip. World Vision, what a great organization. I was uh, talking to somebody, I said, hey, what's the, uh, you know, what's the overhead on at World Vision? I mean, how much of the, of the money gets spent on the kids and how much of it's like spent on CEO salaries and, you know, advertising and stuff like that. And um, 89% of what what's given goes straight to children to wow. the programs, and I don't. For those of you who follow charities, that's a pretty it's really good impressive yeah. number right there. And so, uh, I can just tell you from being down there, I just was so blown away with what they do um, and how smart they are about doing it. I mean, well, they you are said really they even helping people get involved with like the women who have had yes. real trials and helping them to yes. be self sustaining. And I did not. I did had no idea how much work World Vision does when it comes to empowering women uh, in in situations like uh, they may find themselves in some of these parts of Guatemala. But I, a part that I didn't include in the sermon was that two years ago when we uh, did a, a sponsorship drive in a chosen event here at Whole Life, um, the area that we sponsored was a place called Aguacatan. And that's north, or it's it's in a different part of Guatemala than where I went. And I couldn't go there this time because of um, civil unrest in that area and some other issues. But one of the, the cool things that happened is that um, that we, Rashawn and I spans, sponsor a little boy named Gaspar, and Kyla um, sponsors a little girl in Aguacatan. And the little boy wasn't, uh, his family wasn't up for the trip um, to come to where we were at, where it was safer. But the little girl's family was, and so oh, the little girl wow. and her family um, <laughs> got up at 5 a.m. and met us for lunch oh, wow. um, in uh, in a town that was, you know, a, a halfway point, I guess, for everybody. Uh, actually, I don't think it was halfway for us. I think it was <laughs> a lot less than halfway for us. But um, point being, they came down, and this little girl's uh, this little girl's mother passed away three years ago. Mm. Um, maybe it was only two years ago too. I, it, Kyla is pretty sure she has a picture of this little girl with her mother, and so we're not sure if it happened during the sponsorship. We think it maybe did, but this little girl is now living with her grandparents, and she and her sister are both living with her grandparents. Her dad is remarried, um, has a, a wife and a little baby that also came along. But just to give you an idea, like um, this little girl's older sister, who was, I think, 12 or 13 years old, when her mother died, they pulled her out of school. Mm. And she has not been back since her, her mother passed mm. away. And the, the reason that they said was because of money or, or whatever. And I don't know. There was some discussion with the World Vision team of what, what we – because I was like, hey, we – this young lady needs to get back in school. What do we need to do to figure out? And they're, they're, they've told me they're working on it. But this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. The we time, heard these yeah. stories all the time about young women, uh, girls who drop out of school around first or second grade to help take care of the family. The boys stay in school till sixth grade um, if they do that. And, and World Vision is all about helping the women and the men get a good education that means through 12th grade and then what can they do beyond that and i know in our 12th grade is kind of like high high education in that place 
Um, and then they can go on to get other things from there in the, the education system. But World Vision is all about that. But they have to be able to get the, the kids to a place where they're not hungry. It's hard to study when you're hungry and you're wondering how you're going to eat. Um, yeah. You know, the kids that we were meeting in one of the villages, they were watching 45 minutes one way to get to school. 45. Wow. These are like pre-K kindergarten mm-hmm. students all the way through sixth or eighth grade. Um, the teachers are canceling or are stopping school early when it during it gets into rainy season because they don't want to have them walk for 45 minutes to an hour in mud and, and torrential downpours because it's wow. just not safe. So, you know, thank goodness for World Vision that's doing God's work, helping get these kids fed, helping them get into education that's accessible to them that's safe for them. Mm. The school that we visited was not a World Vision school, just but they were trying to help out with that school. That school had no latrines, n- no no bathroom, much less r- running water. But it was better than having no education at all, and I just admired the principal so much that was there. Rochelle talked a little bit about him, but he was incredible. This guy has been working in that area for 12 years. He has an education. He does not have to be there. But he gives of his own time and effort to try to help these kids get something that will help them go places in life and be able to do something to create a better community. And anyway, so like I said, I'm a huge fan of what I saw down there. It was incredible. Uh, just thanks to World Vision for letting me have a, a peek at what's going on and to get a better understanding of it. I wasn't on a mission trip. They call it a vision trip because the point is to go and, and see what's happening and then kind of get a vision of what what can be done. And I can tell you, I came back just thinking, man, you know, I'm just, our, you know, Kyle, Rochelle and I each sponsor a child and then Kyle and Eric each sponsor a child. Best money that comes out of our, our paycheck every mm-hmm. month. Just the best money spent. And I just know it's being used well. And uh, if I ever get to places where my finances are different, I might pick up another kid or two. But and if, for sure, if I can find out about that one little girl, I would do. I would love to see that young lady get back into back into school, back yeah. into school. And um, but yeah. it's just an incredible experience to just meet these people, just see the gratitude that they have for what we're doing here and what people here in the United States are doing to help them. And I think that was the other really amazing message that I heard repeatedly is um, that, that, look, uh, you know, they said, we know we have people that are immigrating into the United States. We don't want that to happen. We want, we love our country. We love Guatemala. We want to stay here. And in order for that to happen, though, we've got to have jobs. We've got to figure out how to get this thing figured out, and that's what World Vision is helping them do, is helping train them how to that's do cool. those things and be able to create beautiful, wonderful communities uh, right there um, that are fully functioning and that give people the ability to survive and thrive. And so, anyway, well, love it. What a great two weekends we've had here just at the church, watching the envelopes and the wall, the pictures getting taken and the, the notes. Uh, my family yeah. got to write notes. All the girls wrote notes to our little girl, Maria, you know, just to see people getting involved and engaged and thinking about it. And um, if you know Bernie Anderson personally, you know that he, 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 being connected with World Vision is like the perfect match if there ever was one. And then just meeting all of the, you know, we've had uh, meetings upcoming before all this happened with the World Vision staff and the people that came and helped us set up the the lobby and do everything. I mean, a ton of work goes into this. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah, Brittany. And and the heart that they each have for this, it's a, they're, they're very good at picking the people that represent them. And once, once I knew Bernie was involved, I knew that was something that I could be involved with for sure. And then, you know, we, I know we've talked about that lots of times, but just a good, um, you know, good charity that, you know, puts some money where their mouth is and puts it at the work where it needs to be. So, I was glad you took over that because what I was going to say <laughs> is we are putting together a World Vision page that just shows our relationship uh, here at Whole Life with World Vision. And if you missed between services, Ken and Rochelle gave a um, – kind of an overview of their trip. We have that video and we will be putting it up on that page. And as soon as we have that done and up, um, I'll let you know here in the podcast and we'll put a link in the show notes to it as well. I think we'll probably also put a photo gallery in there because I'll I'll talk to Randy about what to do, but I have a a Google Photos folder. That's cool. That um, I'm going to be sending out, if if you are sponsoring a child from Whole Life, 
if you don't get an email by the end of this week um, with a link in it to that to that folder, get in touch here with the office. You just email church at whole life dot, uh, dot church uh, whole life dot church church at whole life dot church. There we go. <laughs> I'll get it right eventually. <laughs> Um, and uh, you should get an email from us. The one thing, and the reason I'm saying this is we don't actually, at Whole Life, we don't actually have access to know who from our church um, is donating because World Vision, and being the incredible chair they are, cares about your confidentiality, and they will not even release to us who's sponsoring yep. from our church. One of the things I've actually asked them if they can work on is I said, I get that, but is there a way that I can press a button, it just automatically sends an email to our church members, because I'd like to like send out an email that has sure. a link to this stuff. Yeah. Um, but what we were able to do is kind of go through we saw the pictures. We saw the people who <laughs> who were up on the wall, and we kind of got a list. And now we're gonna we're gonna send you an email with that link. But if for some reason you don't get it and you'd like it, um, if you're a donor, just just send that email, and we'll we'll make sure you get it, and you'll be able to see all the pictures that not only that I took on this trip, but there are several other folks on the trip who took pictures as well. And I've downloaded their pictures. They they gave us a website that we can upload and download pictures from. So I've downloaded. So there's. I don't know. There's a lot. There's there. a lot of pictures yeah. in there. So, and there's a lot of video. If you sponsor a child, there is a small chance the that it was it. videotaped. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, them choosing you. So, How there's cool a couple families that that um, I was in the room to see it and didn't accidentally delete it later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, what? Anyway, yeah, I don't, I don't, that may or may okay. not have happened. All right. Well, let's uh, let's grab a couple of the questions and comments. We only had a few this week, and let's start with. Um, with Aaron, she said, I never thought about that, how a couple of other men in the Bible married the women they asked for a drink of water. I remember I was like, wow, she is so harsh and sarcastic <laughs> when I watched the episode the first time. Think Speaking of the woman at the well, like, why are you like? get away from me jerk you know like what are you, what are you doing and Eric, i just thought it was funny because yeah. i until you said that it never really dawned on me like and i'm like what are you talking about and then you're like well and oh i get it now so yeah that was a it was a good realization for aaron as well and then she had a, had a question did jacob's bones get brought back also or only joseph's jacob's uh jacob's bones were actually taken back by his sons um, earlier, after, right? After, Earl, yeah, yeah, when, yeah, earlier. Yeah, after he died, they yeah. took him back to Canaan, buried with, him, and then came back with Isaac and I think was it Abraham? Abraham, Abraham yeah. yeah, right. Because yeah. they yeah. asked permission to. Didn't Joseph ask permission correct. to do that, uh, yes. Pharaoh? And he had to do that. Okay, that's correct. Yeah, cool. Well, there you go, Aaron. All right, Rosie said, "I think it speaks volumes about Jesus' clarity to the Samaritan woman. As water is clear, so is he." I'm curious, though, about the spiritual water aspect. Do we drink different types of water? What's the best way to share it with the least of these? Wow. Hmm. That's a deep question. <laughs> that's I like the, it, That one's from the bottom of the well. That is, that is a good, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good, deep question. I do think that there is different forms of spiritual water, that, and I think that Jesus is the perfect, clear, no bacteria in it. I'd say Ken has some bacteria in his uh, in the in, water in that, well. uh, here here and there, and um, but but what I'd say is that Jesus is the is the is that clean pure water that comes through. And the good news is that if you are in Christ, you do not have to depend on Ken to get your water. You don't have to depend on any other pastor, or priest, or anybody. You can get that water for yourself, and it can come straight to you mm. from the source, which is the best way. Ever to get water, um, and so how do we pass it on? Well, I think we do it by introducing people to the source and being more interested in introducing to the source rather than introducing them to the water um, that we are trying to carry from the well or a particular vessel. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Ooh, so I think yeah. that, but sometimes I think, yeah, it's the vessel, or we try to carry the water to them rather than saying, "Hey, that's the water right over there. Go get it." Mm. Um, no, it's, yeah. a, it's a subtle difference, but it makes a big deal. It, yeah. it makes a big difference. Yeah. All right. Now, this is the teaser question that we left with. And I don't know how Stanley, I'll show you guys the paper. That is the question. Wow, that's fairly Whoa. lengthy then. So how in the world did Stanley get that into like a sentence? So I, I don't know, but I expect you to. 
<laughs> I didn't write. I should have written down Stanley's uh, uh, question word for word. And this is from Matthew. Matthew, if you guys were in the chat this week, he is one of our new online worship awesome. hosts. Okay. So last week he was on camera. This week he was uh, just t- kind of testing out the uh, hosting skills along with Stanley on the uh, in the chat room, and uh, did a fantastic job. He added a lot. And he said, oftentimes Jesus tends to approach people who are not like him in terms of status, race, background, etc., to minister to those people. And it shows the character, it shows in the character he is, a character without discrimination. Most of them he approaches tend to be through miracles, illustrations, or parables of miracles. Why is it so easy for those who are not in power to believe him versus those who are in power? Jesus chooses not to show his power to them. I understand that God is not to be bribed, and I also believe he doesn't use his power to bribe people because this negates people's free will, and ultimately this makes God a hypocrite. But sometimes I can't wrap my head around this idea. Why the why does he reveal so much to people unlike him versus maybe people who we would view as have the status or the power, like maybe the religious leaders of his time? I believe Jesus himself said that he said I came to um, to heal those who know they're sick, not those who think they're who think that they're well, Ooh, and um, the lost, and the lost. And I think yeah. that I think that that just like it's always easier to feed somebody who's hungry than somebody who's full. And so I think that sometimes the reason we see Jesus talking to the to the outcasts on the margins because they're the hungry, they're the ones that are looking for. F- fullness. And sometimes those of us who have been advantaged in life, we're less interested in what Jesus has to offer, not that Jesus isn't willing to offer and not that Jesus isn't, but it's just, you know, you, yeah, I don't know if if you, you look at produce differently depending on how hungry you are, right? If, if, if the lettuce is slightly wilted and, <laughs> and things are not perfect, those of us who have the privilege and the blessing and the advantage of being able to buy fresh fresh food might turn up our nose that we might throw it into a trash can. If you are hungry and starving, that wilted lettuce looks pretty great. Mm, yeah. And this is where that metaphor dro- <laughs> breaks down. Christ is perfect, so nothing wilted there. But my point is that I think that um, a lot of times we get... The, I think that because the people who react the strongest are the people who are the most in realizing of their need, mm. we get the mistaken idea that Jesus wasn't always offering that to everyone, which he was. Nicodemus is a great example of that. But just look at the difference in the reaction between the Samaritan woman that's recorded in John 4 and the difference between Nicodemus and John 3. And by the way, those stories are meant to... To um, they were they were put there next to each other on purpose. Jesus re, um, semi reveals himself to a man who's a the most advantaged, privileged part of the society that he lives in. He's the top of the food chain in chapter three, and then Jesus reveals himself to the person who is in society's eyes at the lowest end of that of that of that society and at that time. And and there's. Jesus talks about light and water with Nicodemus. He talks about water with the woman at the well. And so there's these two different things going on. And Nicodemus, the John 4 never criticizes Nick or John 3 never criticizes Nicodemus for his reaction. But what we don't hear Nicodemus doing, what John doesn't record is that Nicodemus went to the Sanhedrin and said, stood up and said, Hey, could this be the Messiah? <laughs> he doesn't do that. He doesn't at yeah. least it's not recorded that he did. Whereas this Samaritan woman goes back into her village and goes, hey, I met somebody who told me everybody thing about it. Could this be the Messiah? You should come and see. And so these are these are kind of juxtaposed. And so I think that kind of goes a little bit sure to your does. question, Matthew, that that Jesus does reach out, but there's often different reactions based on our perceived need of of what Christ has to offer. I I, I do like to think that Jesus does reveal himself to all people because he cares for us all. Um, but some of us are distracted. Some mm. of us may not realize that. And we may be distracted by position in life. We may be distracted by what's going on in our life right now. But I I, I do believe that it's not just a one-time reveal. Yeah. Um, well, no I doubt, think. because right, uh, Nicodemus 
yeah. at the cross, right? Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and called a disciple of Jesus, you know, yeah. a secret disciple of Jesus. And so I think that I don't. I think we need to be careful how critical we are of people. People have their reasons for doing what they do. Yeah. And the good news is sometimes they're bad reasons, but Christ seems to understand and love and care anyway. And so I think, though, that if I had to pick between being Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman in my reaction, I want to go with the Samaritan woman that goes and goes, hey, let me share, what I, let me share what's been given to me. Let, me. let me not be secret about it. And maybe there's a good reason why Nicodemus needed to be secret about it. I don't know. But... That if I want to pick a reaction, I want to go with I want to go with what the Samaritan woman did. You know, and it always yeah. looks that way. I think that we always think about it in terms of return on investment. Like, um, you know, yeah. who's the influential person here that I need to get a hold of? But you know, when you think about it, a lot of times those that are in levels or sense, uh, you know, positions of influence. They have a lot of they have a lot of self to get around, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so sometimes people. That that are in, in in maybe not in those positions have less self blocking them from mm. that piece. Yeah. So you know, I, and I and I get it. You know, why wouldn't you go to the the leaders? Why don't you just go and influence the leaders mm. first? And uh, boy, there's a lot of selfishness to to counteract. I mean, much like if you look at all the disciples, the disciples the same way. I mean, you look at. I think Judas was very much sincere and earnest and wanting to be a part of it, but he had to deal with some huge battles within his own, you know, his own, his own character, maybe even some of the demons that he fought himself. So I think there's a lot of ways to look at how people, you know, for like proselytize, you know, I mean, different people approach it a different way and, and it depends on your journey. So much of it depends, I think on your journey and the people that, that God puts in front of you that many times are like you, you seem to attract those people and people can be genuinely curious as yeah. to, well, you know, I can't believe you're, you're still a Christian. You know, well, when did you go back to church or, you know, th- things like this I've gotten in the past a lot, still do sometimes from certain people I haven't seen in a long time, but it's a different, it's a different mindset that I would yeah. I typically don't go looking because Many times I feel like nobody wants to hear the same old story, yeah. right? And and I, it doesn't feel like that's where my strengths lie or where God helps me. Whereas when someone's asking like, well, I knew you here or yeah. I'm struggling with this and it sounds like we have something in common, that just seems to make an easy an easy playing field to say, well, I can tell you what happened with me. And if that resonates with you, then so, you know, then that works out. I, but... I think it's just a lot of how how and who we are and, and who God puts in our past that may decide those two. Yeah. All right. Next week is The Chosen, Season 2, Episode 3, Matthew 424. That's the throwdown episode. I love this episode. It makes my family so uncomfortable <laughs> that, you know, when they're when they're sitting around, the, spoiler alert, when they're sitting around the fire and everyone's like, you know, trying to be cordial to start with and it quickly turns into... Uh, just a complete den of an, den of iniquity of of name calling and people being at each other for things about their personalities uh, that others don't like or that they think they should be doing otherwise and sounds a lot familiar. But that's a great episode. It's the is that the final? No, that's in the beginning of season two. Yeah, but that's a, I think that, it's uh, episode three. Of yeah, episode two. three. Yep. So that is a whose favorite was that? This week it was Freud's favorite. Whose favorite is next week? I. I think that one had a question mark. I think that's one that I might have thrown in because I liked it. You liked it? Well, this <laughs> so is it's another one of Ken's prerogative. favorites, maybe. Another yeah, Ken. Good. Well, you can do that. Yeah. You know, I, the... I, I did do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do that? So there you go. Way to go, Randy. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> what? You... Yeah, yeah. Occasionally I'll do that. Um, so, Tammy, we're going to do something cool this week for that? Oh, no pressure. I'm... No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not asking. Is is there a what? What? What is the percentages? I think we have. We had a kind of cool idea. We're I'm not, about ninety percent sure about it at Ooh. this point. When, when does this get revealed? At oh, church, yeah. if at you're church. there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's kind of so we're not cool... going to say anything more about it. But it's, no. Yeah. But you, if if you can be in house, it's a participatory opportunity. Not Friday night. For yeah. the, not no. for the viewing. This is church. Church. Uh, Nine thirty. Yeah. 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 This is church service in person. We've got something. I'd love to figure out a way to do it online too. But we're. There's some things that just 
we will work on as time goes by to figure out how to be. But yeah, this is one of those in person type of things. Well, there you go. If you're if you're close, and if you know if you're a typical online, but you know if you're within eight or ten hours, you might just want to give it a drive over. <laughs> That's what I always try to tell people. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. like we have a couple people that, that drive crazy, at least an hour. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, because I go by I now go by the Ken Wetmore idea of when it's a good time to go to church. Yeah. Every week at our life. Yep. So yeah. it doesn't yep. matter how far. Online yeah. or in person, either That's one. True. We're happy to have you either way, and you're part of the family either way. And this week, next week, we are going to shoot for having both services completely streamed. Uh, for those of you that uh, I know a lot of you who <laughs> listen to the podcast also are online viewers, and yours truly did something he... I'm not sure how it happened, but it, it did. And so you got cut off mid... Uh, well, it was close to the en- end of the sermon, but you all were very very kind so you know thank what you. second service sermon was you know was it, it was it was better i think it was better yeah, it was. I think, yeah. so I th- I was you didn't you didn't miss out if you <laughs> if well, you went but if you go back and watch second service you'll be fine yeah when when you start getting the text messages from everybody they start flooding your phone you're like oh no what, what, what happened <laughs> and when i went and looked it had to be me uh, i'm not sure how it happened but i know it had to be me because it's that's part of what i do every week so my apologies but thank you all for being so kind and cordial online we're like ah oh, we'll just Come back for second service. So, uh, thank you for that. So, I'll say I had some good food in Guatemala because we haven't talked about food, but Ooh. I was going to say there was some good food in Guatemala. Good food in Guatemala. That's another podcast. That's that another is. one. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it for this week. So, we will be <laughs> back with episode 375. We're going to be Matthew 424 Friday night at 7 o'clock. If you're here local for the viewing, seven, 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 seven yeah. p.m. Yep, and then nine thirty and twelve, just like normal at church for cool. first and second, and the chosen continues. Thanks, guys, for listening, and have a great week. Ciao.